greed, violence, and betrayal, these are the ingredients that brought down the once mighty national president of the Mongols. The former national president of the notorious Mongols motorcycle gang has pleaded guilty to racketeering conspiracy. You're talking homicides, narcotics, and some extremely violent individuals. Charges against Ruben Doc Cavoso stem from a case that accused other Mongol members of murder, drug trafficking, and violent attacks. This is a man who was so consumed by greed and power that he almost destroyed the Mongols' motorcycle club, nearly burning it down to ashes and turning his once formidable ally into his greatest enemy. The Mexican Mafia had placed a green light on the Mongols. They have to kill us first, we have to kill them back, and he didn't even stop there. He went so far as recruiting members of the police into the club. Doc put employees of the ATF in decision-making positions within the club. How did a man who wielded so much power in the biker underworld get drunk from the same power? Was he a fraud that managed to fool everyone in the underworld? He never even rode a motorcycle half the time because he was really scared of motorcycles. It's ridiculous. Or was he just a naive man pursuing the pleasures of life? finding himself deep in the annals of crime where he had no escape. Tonight, we shall explore how Ruben Doc Cavossos became entangled with the Mongols, destroying them piece by piece while lining his pockets until he was caught. This is the story of the president who almost destroyed the Mongols. The birth of a outlaw. Ruben Doc Cavossos was born in the cold Chicago air on December 28th, 1956, in Cook County Hospital. His father, Alvaro, had come to America from Mexico to find work, while his mother, Linda, was a restless free spirit of German and Irish descent. Her free spirit eventually led her to abandon the family just two years after Cavosos was born. And so, the chaos began. With his mother gone, Alvaro packed up his sons and headed west, chasing field labor jobs until finally settling in the gang-infested streets of northeast Los Angeles. Little did he know that this place would mold his son, Ruben Cavossos, into one of the most vicious gang lords in California. There, in the Highland Park neighborhood, young Ruben was thrown into a cauldron of violence from his first days at La Russo Elementary School. The tough streets hardened the child at a very early age. He was part of a street gang, but he fought incessantly, developing a reputation that drew the Mexican street gang avenues like sharks to blood in the water. When Ruben refused to join the avenues gang at only 12 years old, they descended on him, savagely beating him up during an initiation and then baptizing him by force. He was an avenues gang member, and he felt like that was the life for him. The avenues gave him a family, they didn't judge him or his lust for blood. To them, he was their own, but not for long. The dual life. His family noticed he had taken on a rough path, and they decided to intervene. They wanted him to be a normal citizen, go to school, graduate, get a job, get a wife, have 2.5 children, save for retirement, retire, and die. But Reuben was not normal. Despite his entanglement with the Violent Avenues gang, he displayed a knack for academics and ambition. After numerous scrapes with the law as a teen, including armed robbery charges, he earned his way to the University of Texas, becoming a licensed radiologic technologist. Working hospital jobs in L.A. provided a solid middle-class life. He got a home in the Pico neighborhood, a son, and a beautiful wife. Yet Ruben's roots remained planted in the unforgiving soil of the avenues, and his desire to be both respected and feared drew him to the Mongols Motorcycle Club. He quit his job and set forth on a new adventure. After joining the Mongols Club in the 70s, he was forced to dedicate his life to the club. Till death do them part, he already had his eyes set on the prize. From that moment henceforth, 
He was no longer just Reuben, he was Reuben Doc Cavossos. Crazy life as a Mongol. After joining the Mongols, Doc Cavossos quickly rose through the ranks. How? How could he, when he was barely a biker? How did the Mongols allow this seemingly obnoxious outsider to infiltrate the ranks and rise up? It was because Doc Cavossos was a schemer. Doc rose rapidly because he was a good recruiter for the club. When he joined the club, he noticed a lot of disgruntled members were unmotivated. The Hell's Angels were on their necks, and the Mongols had no numbers to fight back. So naturally, Reuben Doc Cavossos began recruiting members without vetting them. All he cared about was the power these new loyalists would give him. Mongols recruited as many as 200 new members to beef up their ranks. With these new numbers, he could outpower the current leaderships of the club and install himself as the king. He had calculated it all. One by one, he recruited former members of the Mexican Mafia and any gang member who cared to look his way. This did not sit well with the Mexican Mafia. Nevertheless, the Mongols swelled their ranks, patching over most Hispanic street gangs en masse. These bandits' only allegiance was to their father figure, Document. His young army transformed the club into a potent menace on the streets, until they came face to face with the real devils, the Hell's Angels. The Mongols versus the Brutal Hell's Angels. It was an event sponsored by the Hell's Angels and lasted for five days. Bikers from all around the country gathered to have fun at Nevada's playgrounds, including the Mongols. But remember, there were territory tussles between the Mongols and the Hell's Angels throughout their history, so tensions were high at the event. At the beginning of the event, the Mongols' president, Roger Penny, attempted to arrange peace between the Hell's Angels and the Mongols so that both motorcycle gangs could enjoy the festival. But this was a short-lived respite. Another Hell's Angel had a different idea. Ray Folks came into the event looking to fight. He kicked a Mongol member in the chest, which, of course, started a fight. After that, it was a free-for-all. This was not tolerated by the Hell's Angels, and the war began. What began as a typical event burbled into outright war as the Mongols and Hell's Angels traded blows, gunfire erupting in a shocking incident during this celebrated casino battle in Laughlin, Nevada, 22 years ago. One Mongol and two rival Hell's Angels were shot or stabbed to death, nine others were injured. The brawl left three dead and 13 hospitalized, including the Mongols' president, Roger Penny, in a near-fatal attack. You can see Reuben Doc Cavossos was right there on the forefront, handling his business as a leader is supposed to. But it is believed that Reuben, in an act of cowardice, left Roger Penny down on the floor as he took off to safety when things got too hot. He was Penny's right-hand man and was supposed to protect him, but he ran when Penny was shot. Penny was eventually rushed to the hospital. But the Mongols were left leaderless in the meantime. So naturally, while Penny clung to life, Doc seized control unchallenged. He was power-hungry and wanted it all. He didn't mind a little violence, nor did he mind giving a good fight to the Hell's Angels. And so his reign as the Mongols' president began. As you would expect, if you cross the Mexican Mafia, the penalty is death. Remember how Reuben had started recruiting from the pool of Sereno's dropouts? Now, as president of the Mongols, he went on a recruitment spree. He recruited new talent by just opening up the door. Then the Mexican Mafia said enough is enough. He had had his field day, and they had reached their boiling point. Doc's aggressive recruiting from Mexican Mafia ranks had angered this powerful crime syndicate even more. They're already violent, what he wanted to do was use the Mexican Mafia to start controlling drug trafficking, 
to control certain geographical areas. The Mafia decided they wanted in on the pie. They demanded 50% and taxes from the Mongols' new hybrid force. The Mafia also now wanted the Mongols to pay an ongoing drug tax, just like any other Southern California gang. When Cavossos refused to pay, the incendiary decision put the Mongols at war on two fronts against their most formidable foes, the Hell's Angels, in the front, and the Mafia in their back. Sandwiched between two of the most ruthless gangs, Doc, rather than being concerned with being a good president and a good club brother, became infatuated with the Doc Cavosso story. The Brutal Downfall The tipping point came when some Mongols members crossed a local drug operation run by the Mexican Mafia's Basid Grande street dealers. What ensued was a scene reminiscent of an old-school Mafia Netflix film, a deadly series of retaliations and counter-strikes exploded across the area in a storm of automatic weapons fire. And that wasn't even the last one. As the body count mounted, Cavossos played a deadly game of thrones, leveraging the growing carnage to consolidate his own power and wealth. He behaved provocatively, sought publicity for himself, and continued to embezzle his club's money, prompting the old guard Mongols to further alienate him. By 2008, with over $250,000 siphoned from club coffers into his own pocket, the remaining old-school members couldn't take it anymore. The warlord's treachery and greed had exceeded its limits, and it was now time to cut him off completely from the club. On August 30, 2008, during a meeting in Vernon, California, he was voted out and kicked out bad. But that wasn't the nail that sealed his coffin. His bad recruitment habits had done worse damage than he could ever imagine. Infiltrating the Mongol Motorcycle Club was easy because the Mongols were looking for new members. The infiltration now out in the cold, abandoned by his brothers, and with the Mexican Mafia declaring an open contract on his life, Cavosso's reign had come to an astounding crash. But federal authorities were already moving in to dismantle the Mongols. Government agencies are known for their dirty tactics, and they have a hard-on for MCS all the time. In his endless hunger for power, Cavosso's had recruited a huge number of undercover cops, patched them over, and even put them into positions of power. The biggest mistake he made was bringing a bunch of ATF guys into the Mongols and patching them in. They headed the major offices, worked with every criminal, and knew everything about the club. Bill Queen, the undercover agent, was actually a full patch member for two years and two months. That's the longest that an undercover agent's actually been a full patch member. No one knew how that occurred, but it was because Reuben wanted power, and they helped him get it while gathering evidence to perpetrate one of the biggest busts in RICO history. In 2008, it happened. Operation Black Rain marked the Mongols Motorcycle Club's conviction of racketeering and conspiracy. Operation Black Rain was an elaborate multi-year undercover sting, infiltrating the Mongols' ranks and leading to a sweeping crackdown across six states. In October 2008, we arrested and convicted three different sets of national officers, numerous chapter presidents, and everybody from top to bottom that was involved in criminal activity. Nearly 700 federal agents swarmed with tanks and helicopters, arresting 61 Mongols on a staggering 162-count indictment, including racketeering, murder, drug trafficking, and weapons charges. Among them was the newly ousted Cavossos himself, whose lavish West Covina mansion was swarmed by SWAT teams. In the aftermath, the infamous Mongol warlord did the unforgivable. He turned informant, immediately cooperating with prosecutors in a desperate bid to walk free. Though his 14-year sentence seemed a slap on the wrist compared to potential life imprisonment, within the outlaw ranks, Doc Cavosso signed his own death warrant through his ultimate act of betrayal. For the man once poised to rule an unstoppable criminal empire, he had been reduced to a degenerate. 
He got twin executions, a federal prison term, and the eternal vengeance from the Mexican mafia he had so arrogantly defied. The incendiary rise of the Mongol warlord Ruben Doc Cavosos was over, but the blast radius of the cartel-backed chaos he'd unleashed would burn for years to come. But I will bet money we'll hear from Doc again. Thanks for watching. Do like, subscribe, and comment.